for mean? Uh, I really don't know. I think it, it might be uh, referred to a site for. That might be what the S is for, but uh, I really don't know. There are three S4s in all of the Nevada test sites. I, I don't see. know if I ever mentioned that. No. Me. The nuclear test site itself, I think, has uh, is a small area, and it has uh, uh, sites or areas 1 to 29 or 30. The S4 there, I think, is a nuclear reactor. Uh, there's an S S4 just south of the Tonopah test range, and there's an S4, the one that I worked at, just south of Groom Lake. All right. And Bob Bazaar, while working there as a government scientist, saw not only one, but as many as nine flying saucers while he's working there as a government scientist, and he's telling the whole world about it. As a matter of fact, he wants everybody to know that, in fact, there are flying saucers up there. Now, last time you heard, you never really told us what are there plans with these flying saucers? Do you have any idea why we have flying saucers at this point? Why we have them? Yes. I guess it's just uh, essentially research. The, the idea is to back engineer them, to go back and find out how they can be duplicated using earthly materials and technology. Don't know off the top of my head. So that could be used like a time machine, right? Uh, essentially, yeah. That, time, that is time travel. That is possible. Wow, that's really something. Yeah, that's... Uh, <laughs> Okay. Thanks for your input. Sure. Bye. Did you get your answer? Yes. You did 606, huh? Thank you very much. Well. Okay, buddy. Bye. You take care. Bob Lazar is my guest in the studio here. We are in Las Vegas. And if you have a question for Bob Lazar, our phone numbers are 451. This is like a snowball going down the hill. It will become an avalanche, and ignorance will be wiped out. we got to know the truth for once and forever. They are here. Let's find out why they are here and who they are and what their purpose is. <laughs> well, thank you. Okay, Bob, you're all behind you. And Billy, keep that show going, and it's the number one show in America in talk show. Well, thank you very much, Fritz. Uh, he, did you, he did explain to you why we have flying saucers, right? Well, I'm aware why they are here. I mean, the general public has to become aware. Yeah. You know, they're just wakening up. It's like a veil... Right been lifted from their eyes. I mean, they've been wait, laughing for 40 years. Wait a minute, Fritz. You know why they're here? Why are they here, Fritz? Well, uh, first of all, it's a conditioning process. Okay. We are in, in, you got we, it. We are in a quarantine uh -huh. because we are so ignorant. Right. The ignorance keeps us from meeting them. That big brother reaches out the hand and says, come on, little brother, let's mm -hmm. have the cosmic connection. But then we become a world together. Earthlings, we have to become earthlings. We're not, we are about 170 nations, 170 languages. We become, we have to become togetherness. All right. And when we have a spokesman, uh -huh. then they will meet on us on equal ground. Very good, Fritz. Thanks for the call. Thank you. Bye-bye. You take care. Bye-bye. Bob Lazar is my guest. Let's go to any line that's available. I don't care who it is. We'll find out this. Hi, who's is this on the building coming happening on KVEG? Yes, Mr. Lazar. Yes. Yeah, sure, a big bullshit. Okay. <laughs> so, go to the line. Go to the line. Don't even. There we go. Hi, you're next to the Billy Gibbon happening on KVEG. Hi, Billy. This is Tim from Pasadena. Yes, Tim from Pasadena. How yeah. are you? Yeah, I wanted to talk to Bob a lot, and I'm really glad I got through. He's right here. Hey, Bob, uh, can you tell me a little bit about when you looked into the saucer about how the hatch works and about how it might seal up and all the mechanics involved? Tim, do you have your radio on? Uh, yeah. Please turn it down. Okay. Thank you. Is that better? I mean, turn it off, if you would, because you're getting feedback. I can hear it. Okay. There you go. Is it better now? Uh, okay. Okay. The, uh, the hatch, the hatch or whatever it was, the hatch was completely removed. It was, there was just an opening in the side of the craft. And, uh, well... So I, re I really don't know how... Did the opening have any kind of ceiling around it or kind of a, a lip or anything like that? Uh, I really don't remember because I was so interested in looking inside. I didn't really catch, uh... You know, a strong glimpse of the ceiling mechanism or any other thing around it. Now, uh, your last talk, uh, if you'd go along with me a little bit, your last talk when you were on the Billy Show here, uh, you said something about you looked into one and it, ha and it was all smooth, like it had been a wax uh, casting or something. Yeah, exactly. Now, was that the only one you looked into, or was the other one? Uh, was there another one you looked into? No, it was the only one I looked into. Huh. The the other ones I just saw from a distance, so. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know any detail. And, and the one you looked into, was that the sport model? Yes, exactly. And that's the only one you saw fly as well? Right. Okay. Uh, what, can, can you tell us what, what your work was there? Well, like I said before, it's essentially to back engineer the propulsion and uh, power system. So you weren't really uh, involved in the, in the mechanics of the craft itself? No, not at all. And, but mostly just uh, the element 115 and all that kind of stuff you were learning about? Right. Huh. 
Well, okay, well, I'll, I'll uh, get off now and let somebody else ask you another question. Then. Thank you, Jim. Okay, thanks. thanks, Bob. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Uh, Bob Lazar is my guest. Listen to the Billy Gibbon Happening. We are in Las Vegas. Well, gravity's a wave. It's, uh, it, it, it's a force, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, just like uh, electromagnetic waves are uh, a different type of force. Uh, I really don't know a good way to describe gravity, actually. It's, uh, Wasn't that the same thing with like Einstein and other scientists? They really don't have an answer for what gravity is, do they? Totally. They don't really understand it totally, do they? No, no, not at all. In fact, I don't think we understand anything about gravity. Yeah. Um, and uh, why is it that we don't just float away ourselves? Why, what keeps us down on the planet? It's a, well, that that is the uh, attractive force of gravity. Attractive force. So it's an attractive thing, as opposed to a. You know, some people say because they've asked me, it sort of like presses down, but it doesn't, does it? No, it doesn't. There's it's no an pressure. attractive force. It's like a, on an atomic scale, the uh, uh, strong and weak nuclear forces hold uh, the atoms mm. individually together. Mm -hmm. Well, Bob Lazar is my guest. We'll get back. Uh, yeah, I, you can use either right, one. Right. Yeah. Now, you are no longer uh, a government scientist or physicist, right? Uh, not employed by the government. Not employed no. by the government, okay. But you are continuing in the science the end of things. Field, yeah. what, what do you do uh, to keep yourself I occupied? I design uh, and build uh, advanced radiation detection equipment, mainly uh, uh, alpha radiation equipment for uh, uh, essentially use in detecting plutonium. Oh. For uh, National Laboratory. Very interesting. Okay, let's go back to the telephones and your telephone calls from my guest tonight, Bob Lazar. Hi, who's this? And the Billy happening on KBEG. Hello. Billy. Yes. Billy, it's Lee, uh, Lee Samuels. Yes, Lee. Hello, Billy. How are you? Bob, how Hi. are you? Hi. Bob, a couple of questions. Number one, I'm cruising down Jones Avenue on my cellular phone here. Uh, how long has that craft been on, uh, been on, the, on this earth? Oh, I really don't know. I don't even know how long it's been down at uh, S4. Do you know where, where it had originally landed that? No, you got me <laughs> on, on all that stuff. They really never keyed me in as to... Uh, you mean it could have been here for years? Yeah, I, yeah. or it could have been, you know, uh, brought in in pieces from uh, from somewhere else, too. Okay. And did you see just one craft or a number of craft? I saw a number of them. Okay. Uh, but didn't the other workers talk about it and, and say, you know, where it came from or... More is being towed in or whatever? I don't know. There really wasn't that much conversation between everyone. Were you by yourself when you would investigate the craft? Uh, by, my, by myself, as walking by myself, there were security people around me, but uh, when I crawled underneath on the subfloor to look at the gravity amplifiers, you know, I, I got away from them, uh, but uh, there was no one, you know, right next to me the whole okay. time. Okay. Any evidence of uh, live aliens held captive? Uh, nothing I could put my finger on. I, I, and then you didn't see any at all then in, in that sector? Nothing I could put my finger on. Yeah. Uh, did, did, does the craft have sleeping quarters for aliens? Is, is it like a regular, like a Star Trek craft? What kind of craft? Uh, no, it, it's actually a, pretty vacant inside. Uh, granted, a couple things were removed. They were sawed off uh, at the base. I don't know what they were. I just right. saw little stumps on the ground. So I really don't know what was removed, but it, it doesn't look like it had anything like sleeping quarters or anything like okay. that. Okay. Any writing or anything that you detected or any sort of language or anything? No. On the walls? Nothing. Any panels or anything? Did you say like a, like a, like a dashboard on a car? <laughs> it just uh, like yeah. That? In fact, that was one of the things. That, there were more than one uh, control panel uh, setups, but uh, it looks like one was removed. Okay. And uh, was this craft all from the same source? I mean, or, or, uh, what do you mean? I mean, is it all from the same, uh, the craft all identical, or? No, each each craft was completely different in physical appearance, and I didn't get to look in depth at the other crafts, but uh, I only really fooled around okay. with one. Thank you, Bob. I applaud your courage. Thank it's you. It's great for you to speak up. And Lee, you, Lee, Lee, before you leave, uh, uh, tickets go on sale tomorrow for the Donald Curry fight? Yes, there were Bally's, uh, uh, Bally's Casino, uh, big fight, Donald Curry against Irish Brett Lally. Both fighters are in town. Yeah. That's a real, real big show. Uh, Curry says if he doesn't win, he'll retire. So, That's uh, it. Uh, he's a two-time former champion. Right. He's up against it. It's, it's going to be a real, real big show. And you and say... Billy, he... I know you're coming to the press conference tomorrow. Yes, I am. And, I, and you want to say... Bob Lazar, you have, you have ringside seats. How's that? That show, if you want to come. Well, you, thanks. You tell Billy, and uh, we'll, we'll fix you up. Okay, now, before you go, though, let me ask you a question. Did you say that Donald Curry is actually the underdog in this fight? Yes, 
six to five take him either way. And I, wow. The last time Donald fought, he was a hundred to one favorite. Right. And he lost the fight. Who did he lose to that? that? Rene Jaco in in France. Mm -hmm. It was a WBC uh, championship fight, and he lost the fight. It was incredible. Why? Why are people so down on him that they think he can't, doesn't have yeah, it anymore? You know, when you lose to a, to a hundred one dog, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, but uh, I know I'll see you at the press conference tomorrow, Billy. Yeah. You sure will. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. All right, bye bye. Uh, Bob Lazar, uh, you were saying something about uh, entering the craft. You know, and that seems to be the report every single time. Someone says they reported a spacecraft, they were inside. There's nothing in there except, like you say, a, a panel board and some chairs and things. But no sleeping quarters. No, nothing at all. I guess they just don't have it. They don't need them. I guess <laughs> they don't sleep or whatever. They get here so quickly. Let's take another call. Yeah, Billy. Yes, sir. You know there's only 62 tickets left? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, I went there today, I bought a ticket, and they said uh, they almost sold out. Is that right? Yeah. Well, that, that gentleman that was just out in the line, Lee, was, I can see the smile on his face right now. Yeah. Because he was the, he's the promoter of that event, you know. Oh, is that right? Yeah, so he, yeah. he's smiling. Look at the smile on Lee's face now. Yeah. Only 62 tickets left for the... As, uh... of, as of 12 noon, I guess. Okay. Uh, Bob Lazar. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've got a magazine from Borderland Sciences in front of me. And they mentioned one of the books, the, the Energy Grid Foundation Equations and Ramifications by George Res Resonese. Have you heard of him? I, I think I thumbed through that book once. I think John Lear won that. What the heck is an energy grid on, on our planet? Uh, I don't know. I don't really buy that uh, <laughs> yeah. buy that theory or really anything in that book. It's a, a grid outlined all over the entire globe. And uh, at each intersection, there's an energy vortex of some kind. And... Uh, uh, you know, I, I'd just rather not comment. Yeah, I really yeah, don't, okay. don't buy it. Uh, on TV, you mentioned something about the, the time warp, and you, you mentioned uh, folding over. Right. What, uh, what did you mean by that? Uh, it's how uh, gravity, whether produced artificially or naturally, distorts time and space. Gravity distorts time and space? Yeah. Oh, boy. Uh, I'll have to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, as a matter of fact, we were, we were talking off the air, and, and people have been calling me at the office about this gravity thing, and Bob Lazar has kind of leveled it and said it right straight out. Yeah. Nobody really understands gravity. Yeah. And what it does and, and everything else, it's, it's still being looked into, and even Einstein yeah. couldn't figure it out. Yeah, I, I read about Nikola Tesla questioning uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. Uh -huh. He says that energy doesn't come from matter. Well, where does it come from if it doesn't come from matter? Hmm. Can you answer that, Bob? Uh, that's a strange question. Yeah. Uh, it can be extracted from matter, uh, but it can be extracted by other means too. I really don't don't understand that. Yeah. Uh, are you are you going to be there January seventh? Uh, no. You're not going to be there. No. Well, I wish I could talk for an hour, but uh, everybody else wants to talk, so I'll hang up. All right. All right. Thank you. Take care, guy. Let's take uh, another call. A, a new member. Let's talk to a new member and see where. Uh... Hi, who's this in the building of it happening on KVEG? Hi, this is Tom. Yes, Tom, from where? Um, La La Land. La La Land? Right. Where is La La Land? Uh, L.A. Okay. <laughs> L.A., La La. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm... Yeah, I have uh, one general question and a uh, couple of specific ones. Mm -hmm. um, UFO reports have been going on now for 30, 40 years. Uh, I don't doubt the credibility of. Mr. Lazar, uh, I just wonder how how this can be kept secret for that long. Uh, ask him to comment. Hmm. Uh, I, I did pose that question to some people at S4, and the answer that I got was it's it's the easiest thing to keep secret because of the subject matter. Do you have a feeling that uh, one of the reasons that is is because um, it's tied in with a lot of uh, Parapsychology, psychic type stuff, uh, National Enquirer. Maybe so. I mean, there is so much disinformation, uh, and that is made so available to the public via the tabloids and things like that. That uh, you know, any true information getting out is uh, assumed to originate from those sources and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, another question is: um, uh, Carl Sagan is. Uh, more or less a, a people scientist. He's brought science down to the general public. Um, right. What about getting him involved in this somehow? Is that possible, or how would you go about doing that? 
I would imagine. Uh, I imagine he's fairly open-minded. I've never met met him. Well, he's uh, one of the biggest uh, UFO debunkers. That's why. Uh, what I was thinking of doing actually is uh, making, getting some copies of the t uh, the shows that you're on, the happenings. I'm sorry, and uh, you know, contacting people at the Planetary Society. Hmm. Um, I don't know if that would do any good, but. Well, you know, there again, he's going to need his own own proof, as everyone should require. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's it's impossible to make a, an absolute believer out of someone that, that hasn't had hands-on experience or have seen something for themselves. Uh, you know, that, that's the way any scientist is going to look at it. Okay, a couple more quick questions. It's around 32 light years, something like that. Okay, so uh, these ships, uh, do they travel faster than light, or do they get around them? Oh, it's kind, of, it's kind of an irrelevant question because it, they get around it because they're not in a linear mode of travel. Since they're di distorting time and space, there's no true time reference. And since velocity is distance over time, when you begin to fool around with time, you really can't uh, state a true velocity. All right, John, thank one you for more, your call. One more quick question. Quickly. Okay, he'll answer uh, off the air. Yeah. The, the SETI program, uh, the search for radio signals, um, couldn't uh, some of these... Uh, you know, observatories or, or telescopes be aimed at, uh, you know, places where they, these people or aliens have supposedly come from. Uh, Zedi, uh, I think um, Cooper mentioned uh, Barnard. Okay, that's your question. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, it's, it, my understanding is that, that uh, radio waves and uh, frequencies along that bandwidth really aren't, aren't utilized. It's gravity wave communication. And uh, a radio telescope really isn't going to pick up anything of that sort. All right, Bob. I don't think people realize this because you said it so nonchalant, but your first time on. The way you got to see this UFO was really not planned by anyone wanting you to see it, right? You were like walking with security and you went under a doorway. How did you describe that before? Uh, it may have been planned by them, but <laughs> it, I, I had no. Uh, advance warning of it. I have I've been brought in a separate door the whole time, and uh, one specific time I was uh, just let into the area where I work uh, through the hangar doors, which I had never been in before. It walked directly by the craft and uh, began to slow down by it, and they said just keep walking, keep your eyes forward, and uh, and it was just just like that. It was that nothing was said, and uh, I just went and sat down in an empty room. You went and sat down in an empty room after you saw it. Yeah, waited for okay. this guy that I work with, Barry, and then we went to, uh, you know, work on some of the uh, work we were assigned to. Okay. What were some of the things? What was some of the work that you actually did that you were supposed to do? What What did you actually do it as for? When you say work, you had to wait for an assignment. When you, when you had the assignment, what would it have been, like, for example? Well, most of the, like I said before, most of the time I worked there, I was being briefed on uh, and being brought up to date on what had been done before. Right. And most of the hands-on bench work, essentially, was with uh, the reactor itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, being shown how it operated, uh, it, giving demonstrations and, and things of that sort. When you say reactor, you know about a nuclear reactor type? Uh, antimatter reactor. Antimatter, oh, okay. Bob Lazar is my guest, and boy, I'll tell you, it's fascinating to hear this stuff. Let's go back... Uh, to some of the stuff you already touched on us and try because someone asked earlier about communication with some of your fellow workers mm -hmm. there was practically no communication right yeah they kept that to an absolute minimum they were on the buddy system you worked with always worked with someone and that's the person you communicated with and there was really no crosstalk between groups Amazing. and you as a young man there you are in the midst of this thing when, when you went there for the initial uh, interview you said at the time they actually had a gun at your head uh, no, 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 that was at the security briefing. Security, whatever that means. Or the initial interview when you went to work at S4, I'm talking about. Did they, that's not where the gun was at your head? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, when you went there, what was your understanding that you were going to be doing? Uh, some high technology work, and I had assumed that they were talking about some sort of gravitational propulsion system. And, and were you excited about that? I, uh, oh, yeah, very yeah. much so, because it, there was uh, some talk about that, uh, because it, it's something that I was interested in, something mm -hmm. they knew I was interested in. And, right. Uh, you know, that was that was the hint that I got. And did it come to fruition? Did, 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 did what you were told you were going to do actually happen? Yeah. Oh, it did, oh, yeah. for a period of time. So how long were you actually there before you uh, let people know what was going on up there? Uh, how many months or days, whatever? Uh... Approximately, I know you probably. Yeah, I, I really don't know. Uh, 
Probably a couple months, I guess, months. before. Uh... And, and every time that you went there, you literally had to fly up, land at Groom Lake, take a bus, a, a bus that was sort of blacked out of the windows, right. and no communication on the bus. What were you thinking as a young man? You're a very young man, let's face it. What were you thinking while you... Young. Well, you're, you're a very young man, I think you are. Anyway, what were you thinking? Were you just saying, well, this goes with the territory and I'm just going to go along with this? Or? Oh, yeah, you bet. Sure, <laughs> I would have I done that and much more just to be involved with the project. Ah, the excitement was just being there, being a part of the of what was going on behind the scenes. In other words, the secret part about it or... Oh, sure, I would have yeah. taken a lot more crap than they had dealt out. <laughs> Can you picture it? Okay, well, uh, he's in his 30s, so I, I say young man, and he's in his 30s sitting on a bus and, and accepting the fact, okay, I'm going to work this morning, not talking to their his uh, compadres on the bus, is looking straight ahead, uh, blackened out windows, not driving on asphalt, uh, all dirt roads. Didn't that also have something to do in your mind, say, well, how come they never did anything up there as far as the dirt roads? Uh... I don't know. It was a good dirt road. But even, <laughs> uh, a lot of the roads around there are dirt. In fact, I know almost, it. Almost all are. That's what I'm saying. They didn't even take the time to uh, to pave them. I guess it's not that important. Bob Lazar is is uh, my guest, and well, I tell you, uh, I'm fascinated. Hello, Billy. Yes. Can you hear me? Uh, we sure can. Okay. Uh, this is Mark, the artist in Los Angeles. All right. I got some specific questions for Bob Lazar that I'd like to ask real quickly. He's right here. He's waiting. Uh, I talked to you once before on the show, Bob, about uh, the propulsion system on the device. Yeah. And you uh, described the central column as being a, uh, a gravity wave guide. guide. Yeah. There was a disc towards the bottom of this thing down near the uh, antimatter generator that uh, that spins. And I want to ask you what that disc is made of. Or disc that spins? No, there's no spinning disc. What is the disc made of? Is it a capacitor? Well, I... Uh, a disc, uh, at the waveguide extends down and it uh, widens out and sits on the curved portion of the reactor. Mm -hmm. uh, the bottom of the reactor is a, a plate, uh, but nothing rotates or moves. Mm -hmm. it's, is, all, it's all connected together. Is that plate a capacitor? No. Well, what is it made of? Uh, metal. That's the only way I can describe it. I don't know what kind. It's, uh, oh, did electric... you never determine the kind of metal it was? Uh, not to my knowledge. Um, I understand that part of the propulsion system involves a, uh, uh, a very large capacitor, uh, which is usually the, the, the entire lower surface of the disk, uh, making use of something along the lines of the Byfield-Brown effect. And I just wondered if you had any uh, information on what the components of the dielectric material in that capacitor is. Well, if the bottom of the disk is one plate of the capacitor, then the dielectric material would be the air. Uh, if you're going to look at the Earth as another plate of the capacitor. But as mm -hmm. far as the capacitor being integral to the uh, uh, actual craft itself, no, I found no evidence of that. Mm. Now, uh, I understand that there's an antenna section in this device, and I'm one of those, I was gonna, wanted to ask you uh, what the resonant frequency that that operated at was, what it was. Uh, well, the resonant frequency of the gravity wave I do know, but I don't know it offhand. I can't. I, can't, I just can't remember it. Can uh, you, can you uh, give me a ballpark, like 2,000 kilohertz, something like that? Uh, 200 kilohertz? I really, I really don't remember. It's a really odd frequency. Is it really? Yeah. Well, is it, is it, is it measured in uh, kilohertz or gigahertz or megahertz? I, I really don't remember. Hmm. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you was, when you first started to go public and you were meeting with people at John Lear's house, uh, I understand that there were a number of witnesses uh, at those first meetings, um, one of whom claims that you uh, did say that you had seen an extraterrestrial while working inside one of those uh, saucers trying to back engineer the, uh, the propulsion system, and that you'd been looking out through a doorway or through a porthole in the side of the device and that you'd actually seen an extraterrestrial walking around on the outside of one of those devices. Devices now, meaning discs? Excuse me? Devices meaning discs? Yes. No. So, so you're saying that you've never seen an extraterrestrial at S4? Uh, I really don't want to get into that. <laughs> well, but, the reason uh, I but, ask is because someone else is claiming that you have. Uh, well, stated the way you did, no, I didn't. Uh, and I never did look and see an extraterrestrial. It, it, as the story goes, and the reason I, I never bring it up is because I thought I saw something once at walking at a glance. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that's all there is to it. And so, I never did. And I won't. I, uh, I won't stand on that fact because uh, you know it was just a, a fleeting glimpse. When I came back, mm -hmm. whatever was there was gone. Uh, you know, it, it, it could have been a, a zillion yeah. things. So. Well, I had one last quick question. I'll wrap it up real quick here. 
Uh, I have a contact that claims that uh, you were responsible for determining that element 115 was not, in fact, necessary to operate an anti-gravity propulsion device in the Earth's magnetic field. Is that true? No, it's the exact opposite. Thank you, Mark, for the call. Okay. All right, thank you. Bob is our... Hello? Hi there. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly. I better turn on my radio. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Why are you going public with this whole subject? What caused you? I mean, there's there's obviously a lot of other staff on the project that senses a greater a great degree of loyalty, or something along this sort. And um, why are you going public? Uh, well, the the thing that really was the the straw that broke the camel's back essentially was uh, after I left the program, I kind of became concerned about uh, what happens now. I made a routine request for my birth certificate. Uh, which I needed for uh, just for ID purposes, and I was told that it doesn't exist. I wasn't even born at that hospital. Uh, I, be I sat on that for about a week and just wondered, and then I began to inquire at, at uh, previous jobs and uh, uh, also at other schools, and uh, that information was also gone. Mm. And I kind of got the idea that soon someone was going to disappear, so that's when I contacted the uh, TV station and you know essentially mm. let everything out. But you left the program under very amicable circumstances. Uh, no, that's a long, involved story that I really don't want to get into. Okay. All right, that's fine. Are you afraid of any repercussions from the government, you know? Oh, yeah, I was I was uh, really concerned at one time, but... Uh, uh, less it, so now? Yeah, less so now, but, I, you know, you still keep it in the back of your mind. Yeah. I imagine, of course, it seems like to me that if anything were to happen to you now, that that would cause such an uproar in itself. Exactly. The last thing they would do would be to go anywhere near you. Right. As, as someone someone said in the media somewhere that uh, if they're following me now, it's uh, to make sure that nothing happens to me. <laughs> yeah, I would think the same thing. Okay, your experience up there on the program. Did you um, did you witness any working models, any models of the of the vehicles that were operational? Models. Yeah. I, uh, when I say mo the, the vehicles. The vehicle the itself operational. operational yeah. They would, the, some of them were operational. Yeah, I, I only saw one operate. And they were actually operating. Oh yeah, I saw one at at, uh, at close range while I was at the area, and then at uh, extreme distance, about 15 really? miles, when uh, I brought some friends up to look at it. Using the technology that's uh, that's being used, they the craft are very agile, aren't they? Oh yes, very. In one specific mode of travel. One specific In, mode. Yeah. In one direction at a time, something like this. No, there's two modes of travel. There's a low speed mode and, and a you know a high speed mode. I I don't remember what they call. They had a specific name for them. Okay. But uh, what was the size of the staff working on the project? Uh, it was 22 people that I knew of. 22 people. Well, 22 people in the area that I worked in, and uh, you know how extensive the rest of the facility was. I don't know. I I, I gathered from one of your. Um Earlier interviews that uh, you were frustrated a little bit on the size of the staff. You always thought it should have been larger. Oh perhaps, yeah, so much. It could have been more. Could have been learned about the pro program quit more quickly. Uh, the problem is substituting uh, earthly materials. Really? Yeah, and uh, there's really there's really no easy way easy way of getting around that. Hmm. Okay. Thank um, you for the call, sir. Uh, can I ask one last question? Go ahead, you'll answer. I just uh, pick up just one on uh, one last thing that an earlier gentleman was commenting on that he sounded very knowledgeable as well. Can you explain uh, about the element 115 and how uh, how it's involved in the in the um, in the construction of the vehicle? All right, thanks for the call. He'll answer you up there. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, everything seems to come down to 115. It's a super heavy element element, and uh, it seems that as you get uh, into the heavier elements, and I'm sure this property extends to uh, as yet undiscovered elements in excess of atomic number 115, that the atomic gravity wave inside uh, the atoms holding things together begins to extend outside of the atomic structure itself, and it's this wave that can be ta tapped off and uh, in quantity, you know, small quantity actually, uh, this wave can be amplified, contained, and uh, you know, used for a useful purpose. Very, very good answer. Bob Lazar, that's the voice of power plants and stuff of that nature? Uh, Did it work under that stuff? Not nuclear power plants, weapon. Uh, where they use plutonium. Yeah, right. Plutonium like handle. the la latest uh, flight up a, uh, way above us, right? There's a plutonium flight going on right now. Uh, the Galileo? Yeah. Yeah. Are you involved with that, Mr. Lazar? Uh, not, uh, not directly. Not I mean, someone may have used... Our probes to detect it. Uh huh. Yeah, okay. Fine. We'll get back to Bob Lazar and your telephone calls, but first, this, uh, uh, at any time? Uh, I really don't know. 
uh, I only was witness to uh, a couple tests, and uh, I really don't know. I don't know how far they go. I think they're very careful with them. Uh, I, like I said, I don't. I personally don't think that they're whipping them around the solar system because uh, I don't know how proficient they are with operating them. But uh, I really don't know. And let me ask you: Do you read any UFO literature yourself uh, in book form that's uh, out in publication? Uh, nothing really in book form. Uh, I occasionally get handed little tidbits here and there and, and glance at them, but no, I don't. I don't delve into. Uh, you know, reading. Because you mentioned some uh, stuff on the uh, Billy Myers uh, 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 case there, and I was just wondering if uh, you had uh, read any of that information because you mentioned you had seen some pictures. Yeah, I looked at the, uh, what caught my eye was certainly the, uh, uh, whatever that book's called, Contact from the Pleiades or something, yeah. but it's essentially a picture book. I mean, there's really no text in it. Uh, and uh, that, but one of the craft in there looks strikingly similar to uh, uh, the, the one I call the sport model. That's interesting. I have to get your opinion. What did you think of that similarity? Uh, did, that, did that puzzle you? Uh, uh, yeah, because originally I had kind of discounted the Billy Meyer stuff, but that, that that craft looks amazingly like the one that I worked on. And another thing is he showed uh, somewhere in that book they had a picture of a grassy field with three round indents in yeah. the ground. Uh, now, that would coincide with the three gravity amplifiers in the bottom of the craft and the imprint that they do make. So that ma kind of makes me believe that that, uh, that really did occur. I see. That's very interesting. Now, one last question is, uh, on the first program, uh, I had heard you say towards the end of the program that you wanted to say one thing, which was you didn't necessarily uh, share the same views as Bill Cooper and John Lear as far as the big picture was concerned. And I didn't really understand what you meant by that. Uh, well, I'm really not exactly sure what uh, what each individual story is. I think there, John Lear has a specific story. Bill Cooper has a specific story. I do agree with both of them uh, in in the fact that yeah, there's alien craft here and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, I, don't, I think John Lear, or someone uh, thinks that they're here to use us for food. Uh, I don't exactly remember Bill Cooper's story but the uh the little intricate parts here and there i it's you know i just i just haven't seen any evidence myself of it you know i don't know uh what these gentlemen have found out on their own uh -huh. and from, from, from everything that you know about it do you believe that there is possibility that there are benevolent creatures in the universe oh sure uh -huh. oh sure thank you number 37 thank you uh, my pleasure bob alien beings or are we doing it when I say we, meaning the military, do you think... I think the ones that we're testing, the one that I was involved in, I think is being flown by the military. Okay. Now, you know, whatever else is going All on, right. I, I don't know. And and there you've got a picture. Of, if that was taken over Area 51, you Yes, said, that's right. Uh, According to what it was left to me, yeah. And yeah. it looks like it. If you look at that, if you recognize it, you know, at the peak... Yeah, that, of course, that's a daytime photograph, and I, I was told all the testing is done at night. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, that's uh, interesting. I don't know. Okay, uh, so, so getting back, so you, you think it's more done by the military. They're flying them. Because you described when you went inside one of these little puppies that the, there were very, very small seats, almost like a kindergarten-type look. Right, exactly. So they have to have some small guys doing it. We have to have them some, some real, real oh, no, you, you jockeys can, or something. Yeah, you can squeeze yourself into it. <laughs> okay. You know. Bob Lazar is my guest. Let's go back to your telephone calls because I don't want to, you know, uh, steal this whole thing, but this picture is just totally uh, a mind blower. Hi, who's this in the building of happening on KVEG? Paul from Las Vegas. Yes, sure. Paul. Okay, Bob, I've got a couple of questions. Sure. Do these uh, craft appear to be shuttle craft, not the main craft? Uh, hmm. I don't know how you'd... Well, you know, how do you I mean, differ differentiate bet between the two, other than, or, or, or you know, who says there is, is even a? Well, in most craft. instances, uh, people speak of them joining up with another craft and then going out of the atmosphere. Hmm. Uh, when they speak of, you know, some of these experiences they saw them with. And I was just wondering if these assorted <clears throat> models that you've seen could be classed as, as uh, shuttlecraft in that respect. You know, they, uh, don't, they wouldn't well. carry a big fleet of people. No, definitely not. I mean, they are small. Uh, yeah, I'm guessing right in the you know mid 30 to 40 foot range, so, somewhere in there. Uh, 
and as far as carrying a lot of cargo or uh, or, or beings or whatever, no, there's not a whole lot of room there. So, uh, yeah, possibly there is a, a larger craft that they join with, but, you know, I didn't see any. Okay, and uh, uh, is it true that there's, uh, like, more propulsion, more engines than there are craft that it's for? That's a good question. Uh, hmm. Well, there's nine craft. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I really don't know. Well, I certainly just wondering, were... it would be something to explain how in the hell we got more crap, more engines than we do crap. Yeah. There had to be some kind of an agreement or somebody helping us get them. Right. There's certainly more fuel than there needs to be. Yeah. All right, Paul. How, how do you know so much about it, Paul? Well, I, I follow a lot of, you know, watching them every chance I get. Uh-huh. Let me ask you something, Bill. You were talking about oh, pictures. I got it right here. Bob Lazar, so... Okay. Now, did you see this uh, little girl from South Carolina who took a cassette on Halloween night and saw uh, lights in the sky? No. That, that was shown nationally. Now, as she was viewing those lights and recording it through her uh, cam recorder, mm -hmm. a plane flew by, mm -hmm. which is always one of the big gripes they have of these lights, mm -hmm. that they never get anything to reference right. stuff with. And it showed her house. It showed the plane go right by the lights. Right. And move on and them have got in touch with her and, you know, evidently got these pictures. Now, has somebody researched and come out and showed us that these pictures are, you know, valid? I don't know anything about that. That's one case I'm not familiar with. Are you, Bob? No, I really I'm not familiar with that. First I heard of it. But I will t there are some strange things that occur. I'll tell you a story that uh, Roger Nelson related to me, uh, that uh, one night in San Francisco with the two uh, uh, anchor people uh, reporting the news, that, and one of their reporters had gone out and done some filming, and while they were filming, they had something, and the guy scanned up in the sky, <laughs> and right over their shoulder showed up a UFO. Right over the shoulder. You oh. could see it right there. And they, you know, they, they never released it. They would never, never release it, but uh, it, only the San Franciscans actually saw it. Let me ask Bob one more question. Go ahead. You have one more question, and then check out time. Uh, I'll, take, I'll in, take that. Well, maybe not just a question, but a statement. Bob, in view of the fact that they have uh, released you, and taking away your uh, scientific livelihood. I hope you go on a national circuit. I hope you go on 60 Minutes, a Carson show, everything you can get on, and milk it for every dime you can get. You know, <laughs> because you have a right to do that since they've interrupted your career. But I think the, the big important thing is, is to get these people to get this stuff into the hands of the scientific community that can do some good with it. They've been toiling with it for years and nothing's come out of it. We can't get anywhere. We've got to get it out of the hands of these power mongers. Oh, okay. well, I, I agree 100%. And, uh, I think mean, that's why you took people up there in the first place. You were tired of their games. All right, Paul. Thank you very much. All right. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Well, let's go to uh, line two. I mean, what, like, uh, wh wh where are they calling from? Hi, who's this? Hi, how are you, Billy? Fine. Uh, this is Wes calling you from Charleston, Illinois. How are you? Wesley Crumb? Yes, sir. How are hey, you? how are you? Can you hear us? Yeah, well, I can, uh, I can just pick up what you're saying, uh... Okay, well, Bob Lazar is right here in studio. Well, hi, Bob. How hi. are you? Oh, not bad. Uh, I just want to say it's a great privilege to uh, get a chance to speak with you, and that I greatly admire your courage in coming forward. Oh, uh, I've had an opportunity to uh, see a tape of the KLAS program you did, and uh, you made it out that far, huh? Well, it's uh, I've been I forwarded all the way to Atlanta, Georgia, and I personally, when I first heard about you, I uh, have called. Uh, well, I ran up about a three hundred dollar phone bill calling New York and Chicago, and uh, everywhere I got a rejection notice today from the Donahue Show that they don't want to do a program about you. So, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Uh, seeing as how I've got you here, I'd like to ask a few quick questions. Sure. Okay. Uh, when you uh, became involved with this program, did you get an opportunity to go inside all nine aircraft or spacecraft? No, no, just one. Just the one? Yeah. Uh, when you were inside the craft, did you see any indication, that either through markings on the controls or otherwise, that these ships were from a uh, uh, different place? Was there any writing on any controls or anything? Uh... No, not on controls and and things like that. But I I did I did see some evidence of of writing. Okay. 
When you saw the uh, flight demonstration that was performed for you, were you the only person that was there that uh, saw this craft operate? No, there were several people. I was standing right next to the person who was in radio contact with the craft. Oh, I see. How long did uh, this demonstration last? Uh, it was a short duration. Uh, it lifted off the ground, uh, slid over to the left, then back to the right, and set back down. It, it, it was a very short duration. But you never saw, actually, who was at the control? No, because I was brought out. Uh, uh, when I was brought in, the, the craft was in the hangar. When I came out, it was already out of the hangar and sit, sitting on, uh, well, sitting out away from the hangar some distance. And uh, so I don't know how it was brought out, who brought it out, who got in it. Uh, you know, I can only guess. Uh, this entire installation, that's for Is the entire thing underground, all nine different hangars? No, it's not underground. It's just butt up against the side of a little mountain, little hill kind of. And uh, But it's, it's kind of inside uh, uh, the mountain. Do you feel that the uh, billions of dollars that are being spent on the space program by the administration is a waste of money as we already have these ships in our possession? Uh, no, because look at uh, all the technology that we that we did get out of the space program. Uh huh. So, was it ever uh, uh, disclosed to you that these uh, craft were on loan to us? Is there a chance of them being repossessed at any time? No, none of that was ever disclosed to me. The origin, uh, you know, any uh, a anything about the, the origin, essentially. Oh well, I uh, I. Uh... One, one last question here, Bob, and I'll let you get back to the other calls here. Um, I heard a rumor earlier this evening that your van was shot at recently. Is there any truth to this? I don't have a van. Oh, well, then... I was, I was shot at in my car, but I don't have a van, no. I never so there's no truth to that car. one? No. <laughs> <laughs> Can't be no truth to that one. How would you get that information out in Illinois? Well, uh, it got passed on to me from uh, the video clearinghouse in Ukaipa, and uh, we've been keeping pretty close touch ever since uh, this news broke. And yeah. I've, uh, like I said, I've been running up phone bills and trying to get uh, uh, people interested. I did get a call today or yesterday from the National Enquirer, yeah. and I don't know, you know, tabloids know. and what they say, but uh, they might follow up and try and do something for you, Bob. I hope that. Well, the Enquirer is not exactly the best way you want to go, but at least does have some uh, national exposure. And uh, All right, Wesley. All right, Wesley. Settle right. down. Uh, th thanks for the call, and keep up the good work out there in the Midwest for okay, us. Okay, Bill, you keep up the good work. Okay, by the way, what's the weather like out there? Oh, we got about uh, four or five inches on the ground of yeah. snow, and it's real cold. Yeah, like what, what is the uh, temperature? I'd say it's about minus 10 degrees right now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye bye, Billy. <laughs> That's a chilling ending to a call. All right. Bob Lazar is my guest in studio. And We're almost. I, I'm working on it, changing the name to that, Bill. <laughs> okay, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, thanks so much for coming back. I really had some doubts about you coming back, and uh, I'm so glad you have come forward. I've got a number of quick questions for you. One thing that just intrigued me you just mentioned was you said there's more fuel than necessary at the test site? Yeah. I, well, I don't know exactly where it is, uh, but there's 500 pounds. 500 pounds of uh, element 115? Yeah, and it takes 223 grams right. per craft. So there's definitely an abundance of fuel out there. Right. Now, uh, could you quickly describe the underside of these ships? Uh, no, because I, I only saw it as, as from a side view of only one craft. Uh, the other ones were always sitting on the ground. I never saw it, but the the underside is is essentially flat. Now I don't. I never got directly under it uh, to look. There might be some features down there, but I really don't know. Okay. The reason I asked because you were talking about the three uh, distortions that can come down uh, from the uh, gravity engines to uh, distort the uh, the grass. Uh, are you aware of any time distortion within uh, the saucer itself while they are running? Yeah, there has to be. Okay, I've heard reports of that, and uh, but that's about all you know that there is some. Yeah, there there has to be. What about size distortion within the ship? I've heard reports that people who have been in these that the inside seem much larger than the outside would indicate. Uh, I've heard that too, but uh, I really haven't seen any evidence of that. Okay. Uh, what about the difference? You were talking about basically the low speed and the high speed modes and uh, the control factors in there. Can you kind of describe 
each one of the modes and what the ship looks like at the time that it's going through those modes? Okay. Uh, the low speed mode, and I really wish I could remember what they call these, but I can't, uh, as I can't remember the frequency of the wave. Um, the low speed mode, mode the, uh, the craft is actually very vulnerable. It kind of bobs around. And it, it's sitting on a weak gravitational field, essentially sitting on, on three gravity waves. And uh, it just kind of bounces around, and it can focus the waves behind it and essentially keep falling forward and, and hobble around at low speed. Uh, the second mode, what they do is they increase the amplitude of the field, and the craft begins to lift. Uh, and it, it performs a roll maneuver. It begins to turn, uh, essentially roll, begins to turn over. Uh, as it begins to leave the Earth's gravitational field, they point the, they point the bottom of the craft at the destination. Uh, this is the second mode of travel where they bring, uh, they converge the three gravity amplifiers, focus them essentially on a point that they want to go to, then they bring them up to full power. And this is where the tremendous time-space distor distortion takes place and that, uh, you know, whips them right to that point. Billy, one quick last question here for Bob. Uh, now, did you actually bench test a small a, a unit away from the craft itself? The reactor, yeah. And about how large is this, and can you describe it? Okay, Bert, he'll answer off Thank the you. air. Thank you. Yeah, the device itself is probably a plate about 18 inches square. Uh, I said diameter before, I think, but it, it is square. Uh, there's a half sphere, sphere on top uh, where the gravity wave is, is uh, tapped off of but that's, uh, that's about the size of it. Bob Lazar. Bob Lazar answering all your questions on an inside to me. Where would one procure that information? Uh, In books or something? I mean, where would that come out? Maybe. I already forgot his first question. Well, you know it was very in-depth, right? Uh, he was talking about, uh, oh, boy. Yeah, the, the modes of travel. Right. Uh, I don't know. Maybe he's been reading literature. and. Uh, so there is literature on it? Uh, no, but there's U the UFO lore, essentially. Like he said, he's heard stories about time distortions in yes. craft. Uh, uh -huh. I, I imagine, yeah, that's what he meant, or that's where he got it from. So there are people uh, outside the government right now looking into what you, you're you talking about. I would imagine. Ah, well, that's good to hear, because you may never hear from the inside, right? Yeah. <laughs> he goes, you're like, of course you will never hear from the inside. Okay, let's check out, uh, hi, who's this on the Billy Gimmon Happening on KVEG? It's Amy. Hello, Amy. How are you? Fine. Good. Um, first question, are there any um, other items or, or subjects that you won't go into that you won't talk about regarding what was going on at Grim Lake? Uh, about what was going on about? Yeah, about the project. No, I, I don't think so. There's no other? Okay. Uh, do you have future plans for, for more publicity? Uh, there are several uh, uh, networks that are interested. Uh, 60 Minutes? <laughs> uh, that's, that's been mentioned, but, okay. uh, you know, I haven't heard anything officially. Are we, are we going to be... Would you do it? Yeah. You yeah, I, I'd do a major network thing, sure. Oh, okay. Um, are you familiar with the movie that was made uh, several years ago? I think it was the beginning 80s, um, Hangar 18. Yeah, I, I saw. I think I saw that when it first came out. Do you, from your memory, or do you remember any parallels to what you know now? I don't remember enough about the movie no. to tell you the truth. <laughs> um, on your show, you uh, there was a cut of the newspaper that had you in it and an article about you. Uh, I was wondering if during the time that you were at Los Alamos, I was wondering if you remember what paper that was. That was the what? Monitor. The Monitor. Do you remember when it was written? It was uh, like July. 82 or something like that. Yeah. It's, uh, I, th I think I still have a copy at home. Oh. I won't ask you to send me a copy. It's okay. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that a girl, Amy. Do the alien uh, crafts create harmful radioactivity in the area? No. They, no. they don't? No. Um, well, that's good news. Yeah, because there was that the woman uh, that you talked about Billy, on the show a few days ago. Yeah. About the child and, and the two women. Yes. And they now have cancer. Yeah. Kind of doesn't correlate. Yeah, I I believe that was a uh, I've heard of that before, and that sounds 
that sounds like a really poor attempt at us producing a craft. Yeah. Uh, a nuclear-powered craft, really dirty, spewing nuclear material all over the place. It sounds something that we would make. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it first. <laughs> Nothing good been happening. It's something we would put together, right? Not anyone else. <laughs> yeah, it really, it really rings of humans. Okay, Amy. Thanks for the call. Can I ask you just one more question? Go ahead. We'll answer off the air. Go ahead. Um, as best uh, as you can tell. Do the aliens appear to be the same general physical makeup? I mean, from your research on, on the on the, the craft itself, can you tell if, if they're similar to us um, by the way that it was designed? Uh, certainly smaller. But there's no nothing other than that that... Well, not from the crafts. I mean, I, I yeah. read some material pertaining to, you, you know, what they call the typical gray. Yeah. The, you know, it's, uh, I believe them to be that. Thank you, Amy. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs> bye-bye. All right. Uh, well, let me touch on a couple of things. Yeah, you, you, No, you go do your thing. We can't do that right now. Explain to that person, please. Uh, it was interesting what you said about when, they, when you asked for your uh, birth certificate. Uh-huh. And it was sort of, you could not locate it. And they told you, literally, you did not exist? They told you this? I mean, in so many well, words? They said, we just have no record here. Right. Uh, and then you felt within yourself you didn't exist, you're saying? Uh, well, I felt that's what they were trying right. to make. Right. This mode of travel that uh, involved with moving these UFOs around, can you see that as being a mode of travel for us in the future? I mean, you said it only took, like, grams of fuel. That sounds pretty good to me as far as being oh, yeah. efficient. Do you think that's possible that we could be traveling like that in the future? Well, obviously they do, so... Uh... Oh, they do think this. Uh, it, I imagine it's possible in the future, yeah. yeah. I'm talking about like our automobiles would be something like that and travel like that. Uh, it's... And do you have to be off the ground in order to travel like this? You can't be yeah, touching it? Yeah, you, you have I to be off the ground. So we'd be going like this all over the place. Yeah, it's not a very good no. mode of uh, slow speed travel. Right. They wouldn't be getting anywhere and it would be all kinds of things. No, I think, uh, uh, we touched on. By the way, folks, in case you're wondering why I'm doing the interviewing right now, at this point in time, we wait for a report from Houston, which is called Roadwatch America, and I have to wait. Some strange things are going on in your life. You mentioned about car doors being open. Describe what happened the other night when uh, you and your uh, uh, Shelly left the house and you came back and the doors were wide open. I mean, uh, what, what, what do you think about all this? Uh, it's crazy. A, a friend of mine, Shelly, was over, and uh, we went out to uh, a bar to have a, uh, a buffet. Right. Uh, we went out, we locked the doors, checked everything, and uh, we came back uh, several hours later and all the doors were open. And uh, nothing was disturbed in the house, nothing was, uh, you know, taken. Uh, in her car that was left in the driveway, the seats were moved all the way back like someone big sat in them. Uh, I've gone to, uh, with other friends, to a health club that I go to. Uh, we lock the doors and check them, and in fact, you know, I usually keep a, a gun in the car. Uh, and put my wallet on the on the dash. Uh, we've we've come out and the doors have been not just unlocked but actually open. Not not even the wallet taken or the gun. Certainly, kids would have done that. Uh, sure. It's just like someone wants me to know that uh, there's you know they yeah. they're still there. They're still there. And getting back to being still there, the last time you were on the happening, you revealed the gentleman's name. And if you don't want to say it again, it's up to you. You probably do. You didn't care. I don't remember exactly. What was his name? Dennis Mariano. Okay. You revealed his name saying he was the one that was threatening you and he was the one that was really the biggest problem in your life. Have you had any problems with him since then? Uh, no, not recently, no. No, so that's interesting. Okay, Bob Lazar is my guest. We'll get back to your telephone car. Well, it's, I don't know if I'd use that in a car, but if you wanted to, you could use it as an, a, a tremendous electrical power okay. source. Okay, which goes back to the beginning of time. We were going to have electric cars and we were... Uh, convinced we shouldn't have electric cars because we were told we had to plug them in along the way. Since you've gone public with this, you've had contact with them calling you and wanting to know what's going on, etc. Oh, yeah. Well, there, there were a couple that I uh, gave inter information to as we were going along. Uh -huh. And uh, they they knew what was going on already. Okay. Well, they knew what was going on already? Uh, through me. Oh, I see. Uh, the reason I ask those questions that I'm wondering is, is in other words, 
if you had other people to back you up and support you, I think it would, might lend more credibility to what you're saying. That was part of the idea of, of getting it on the news, and uh, I thought hopefully I would shake the tree and have these other guys come forward, and uh, I'll be able to corroborate the story and so on and so forth, and then also have the 115 under my belt, but that all plan backfired. <laughs> so the rest of them don't have the... Have, and this is for them if they're listening. Uh, the rest of them just don't simply just don't have the guts to do anything. I wish they apparently. did. Apparently. Okay. Uh, let's see another question here. Um, let's see. I, I wrote these down, of course. Uh, anything? Uh, I think you mentioned this or little, two phone calls earlier. But anything in the uh, in the works in regards to any other uh, national television coverage or news media coverage of any sort that you know of? Uh, there's been. Uh you know, lots of talk, but uh, nothing, nothing definite. I mean, there's no date set for anything, okay. but uh, there's been a, a tremendous amount of interest. Okay, well, that sounds good. National and, and international, too. And uh, one more question is uh, uh, reference to the, uh, I've heard some talk about the, there's a big underground base up there, too. Did you uh, know anything about that? I've 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 heard that story, but I you know, know I have no or something like that. I've heard. Yeah, I have, I have no first-hand knowledge of it. I haven't been in any tunnels or any okay. underground stuff. So. And do I have, still have time for another one? Oh, one quick question, yes, Bill. Okay, uh, these UFOs. It seems kind of strange to me that if these uh, the aliens that have these UFOs uh, obviously are thousands of years in advance in te technology, it seems. Sure. How in the world would it seem that the the government would come into possession of these UFOs if, in fact, the UFO uh, aliens uh, didn't actually want them to have them. All right, Bill, thank you for the call. He'll answer after you. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Uh, I don't know. The thing is that they look in, in very good condition. It doesn't look like they were crashed, uh, that they were retrieved somewhere. It, it, it really looks like they were, they were given, so... Uh... I don't know. That might be the case. Have you ever given any thought to the fact that maybe they were invited here and they actually landed here and that's why they were here, too? Uh, yeah, it's possible. It's possible, right? They could have come right to this area. Amazing. Let's let's go to uh, one of our new member line and see who's out there. Hi, who's this in the Billy Goodman Happening on KVEG? Hello? Jim? Yes, Jim. From where? Uh, from Las Vegas. All right, Jim. First time caller? First time. Well, I'm glad you finally decided to push those buttons. Uh, I have a big curiosity here. Good, good. Um, for Bob, of course. Right. Um, I saw on TV, he spoke of, of uh, observing a demonstration of this antimatter gravity con wave controller device that he uh, simulated one, I guess, made one himself, a mock-up copy or something. Yeah, a friend made one, yeah. Uh, well, I saw you do that, and I, I heard you speak of uh, bouncing golf balls off of the anti-gravity field. Yeah. And also about the candle, the wax, and the flames that still. Right. And then uh, the hole that you saw up here. It, it yeah, it wasn't a hole. It was a little a little disc. A disc. Yeah. Yeah, a dark disc. My, what I want to know about is um, under what conditions did you see this demonstrated, and maybe you'd elaborate a little bit on this, and how large was the force field? The forced, uh, the force field where the candle was, and the force field created by the um, antimatter device. Uh, I'd say it was probably about 20 inches, was it? a 20 inch radius from the uh, the surface of the sphere. Where, where, where was this area? Just above the device? Yeah, uh, surrounding the sphere. Yeah. Surrounding the sphere. Yeah. It, and did the sphere surround the device? No, the sphere sits in the center of the device. Oh, <laughs> oh okay. It's a I... half sphere sitting on a plate is the best way to describe it. Uh -huh. Okay, and the field surrounds the half sphere. Okay, and you just place a candle in there? No, no, no. <laughs> no, that that was a separate demonstration. I'm just telling you where the, where the field extends from. Uh, oh, that's what I'm curious about. Oh, okay, no, they tap the field off uh, using a waveguide uh, off of the sphere and uh, this is a completely different setup where they had a, a, a mock-up small uh, gravity amplifier and there were three focused into a point and that area of focus was probably uh, nine or ten inches in diameter. That area they displaced this area or moved this area? Uh, no, it wasn't displaced, it's just where the, where the field was generated. Uh, and, and in there you put the candle? Right. 
Yeah, I just uh, Ken can actually bounce golf balls off of it. No, no, the, go- the golf ball thing, again, had nothing to do with that setup. The golf ball thing had something to do just when the reactor was energized before the waveguide was put on or anything. Uh, we were just pushing on the field. I was, you know, it was being demonstrated to me, and we just bounced the golf ball off the top. And, and the candle doesn't melt, and the flame stands still in this disc that you're talking about? Well, in the area, yeah. And you, you don't have to put it in the center or anything? Right. Just anywhere in the area? Well, the, the actual flame of the candle was in the uh, in the area, in the center of the disc. And you saw this happen? Yeah. Uh, thanks a million. No, no problem. Okay. Hey, take care, Jim. All right, bye-bye. Bob Lazar. People, people are saying thanks a million. Re- was that one of the crafts that we made, or was it one that was uh, here, brought here by the agents from another planet? Th- this is a craft of alien origin. From, um, that was brought here by them from another planet? Yeah. And do we know anything about their way of life? Do, no, I'd, uh, I'd really like language? to. Do we know anything about their way of life? or? Do I, I really don't know. Speak I the really same don't language know. or what? I, I really know very little about that. I'd like to know a lot about that. I mean, uh, it, you assume that they mass produce the craft, so there must be some sort of factory somewhere. That means there must be workers in the factory. Do they have a social life? I mean, the questions are endless. I, I'd, I'd like to know myself. And it's also said that they are here. On this planet? Well, if they are here, where are they? That's another good question. <laughs> I've got some good ones for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, you have, what, you have what, another good one for us? <laughs> what do you think about that now? Uh, as far as what? Where? If they say they're here, so where are they? I, You got me. I, I really don't know. Well, if one walks up to my door, what am I supposed to do? I mean, uh... <laughs> uh, has anyone thought about that? They walk up, knock on your door? Yeah, that's a good question, Bob. We make a joke of that. Uh, but if that were the case, see, the government doesn't give us any information. How would you handle something like that? Yeah, if one walked up I to your door? To uh, I don't know. I guess you'll find out really quick if they're benevolent or not. Yeah, that's probably but true. But as, as far as what to do, who knows? You know? But let, let, let's take well, an example there, ma'am. Hold on one second. Like, that's Bob, and I'll ask you the very same question. Let's say you're out in Kansas, out in a farmland. And you see this person that looks really far out. Do you think they're just going to wait for them to come to the door, or do you think they're going to shoot and ask questions later? Uh, probably shoot and ask questions That's the later. problem. Wouldn't that cause all kinds of consternation amongst these people if they find out one of their people were... Uh... Well, you have all the stories of the abductee reports about, right. uh, you know, people in medical examinations. I mean, they go through a lot of trauma and stuff like that. And when it came right down to it, if I was confronted... Uh, by a bunch of them, my car stopped or something to that effect, or, you know, a craft right. obviously in sight. Yeah, I take on a hostile uh, attitude really quickly. Sure, sure, unless you were told differently. Right. By the government, these people don't mean to harm you. They're going to be landing in your cities, whatever, just handle it differently. Okay, uh, uh, one more question. go right ahead. Uh, do you ever think that in the future that our president will, will tell us uh, on national television that the UFOs are here? that he will make it known to us? I doubt it. You don't think he ever will? No, I, I don't think he could muster up <laughs> enough to do that. <laughs> All right, thanks. One of the presidents in the past was supposed to say that if he got elected... Carter. Yeah, he was going to tell us all about it, yeah. but he didn't. Yeah, that, that tells, us, tells you something right there, because he never got in and denied it. He just got in and didn't say anything. He just said right, didn't he? All right, thank you for the okay, telephone call. Thank you very much, Bob. Thanks. Bye-bye. Let's go to a, a new member, brand new caller. Hi, who's yes, that? Uh, yes, uh, this is Bob. I've got uh, a few questions for Bob Lazar. Okay. Uh, did you have a badge uh, when you went to work, Bob? Sure did. Uh, did. Did it have any designation on it? Uh, as far as what? Uh, what did it say? It's uh, a white badge. It has two, uh, a light blue and a dark blue uh, diagonal stripes through it. On the top it says MAJ-12. Uh, the, the clearance level is called Majestic. I don't know if that was... Uh, like I said before, I don't know if that means anything as far as the, the Majestic 12 documents go, uh, or if they just called that clearance that uh, as a nostalgia type of thing. Uh, uh, my picture was on it, and uh, what else was on? Did it have both uh, MAJ and and Majestic, both words? No, the only place I ever saw Majestic was on Dennis. Uh, Dennis's badge, who was my supervisor, and his badge looked slightly different. So uh, I don't know if it was an older kind 
or, or what? Now, you mentioned that you were doing back engineering, but uh, specifically, uh, what was the breakdown of your duties during, for example, one day uh, with respect to, say, what, what your coworkers were doing? How, what was the breakdown, the division of tasks? I, I have no knowledge of what the other people were doing but at all. But you were working with more than, I mean, you were not working simply by yourself. No, just with one person. And what was the difference between what you did and what he did? Well, we, you know, we were in basically the training phase. He was he was getting me up to date on everything, so we never split off. And, you know, he went and did his thing. What were you actually, um, oh, did you ever, I'm going to skip to another question. Did you, did you ever see an analysis or a spectrogram of 115? Yes. And how, what did that tell you? Uh, well, that it was an unknown element. Uh, then we did uh, density uh, and uh, weight calculations, mm -hmm. and, uh, which are pretty basic. And, uh, of course, it was too heavy for its physical size. Uh, we did uh, it was an X-ray spectrograph. Uh, I don't remember what other tests we did to it. Okay, two last questions. Uh, one, how did you know what the times of testing would be to go up to these sites to view the objects? And, and second, uh, do you know where it's being tested now? Uh, well, first of all, Dennis told me the uh, testing times, mm -hmm. and uh, of course those are the times that I relate to other people and we went out there. Uh, what was the other question? Um, do you know where it's being tested now? Uh, I have no idea. In fact, uh, you know, if I was them, the last place I would test it would be S1. <laughs> Thanks for the call. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, I really right. appreciate it. Okay, sir. You're next to the Billy Good Happening on KVG. Good night. Good night. Uh, Al Nico 5, are you familiar with that? magnetic material that we use here for uh, oh, yeah it's a common I never heard the five designation but okay. uh, well it's a developed it's a ten, very dense magnet is that close to the material of 115 oh no not not at all uh, that's that material is uh, that's an acronym for aluminum nickel iron and cobalt yeah uh, none of them being anywhere anywhere near it whatsoever okay uh, the is there portholes in that craft how do they uh, at the very top there's uh, portholes. They're, they're square, though. But they uh, must be able to see by TV or. or uh, I don't know. I didn't. Radar? I, you know, that I just saw from the outside when I was inside. I never. I, I don't think I really even bothered to look up there. I just. I, I don't recall. Well, but the gravity uh, generator is running. Is there a thermal radiation? No, not at all. No. That was one of the. Uh, While running. Uh, well, that, I don't know about. I was never down on the bottom. Uh, while the gravity generators are running, but the reactor itself, there's no, there's no thermal radiation whatsoever running. That was one of the, the really shocking things because that violates the first law of therm thermodynamics. Yeah, right. That's what I wondered about. The atomic weight to the 115 material, is that uh, heavier? We know that 115 and the atomic weight would be different from the gravitational weight. The gravitational weight of that material is very heavy. Yeah. How does that stuff break off? Do you saw it, or does it grind up? How do you get to 10 grams or whatever it is? I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I really don't know how that's machined into it. Uh, I, I know it is machined, but I don't know if there's any special procedures employed. Uh -huh. uh, does it melt? I'm sure it does. Uh -huh. I'm, and uh, just historically, uh, all heavy elements are also toxic. I imagine it is uh, a very toxic thing. Uh, what else? And if you use the standard designations as started at 103, its name would be Ununpentium. Oh. Uh, and its its symbol, if it's going to be plugged into the periodic chart, would be UUP. Oh. And, uh, in fact, I have a friend that gave it a kind of a cute name. He calls it Unobtainium. <laughs> <laughs> like Berkelium, huh? Yeah, exactly. Okay. The other question, variable question, was that uh, do you think you would be able to, in your wildest dreams be able to create any of this stuff on earth uh you need to in order to do the same thing well certainly i can i can uh, in fact i'm in the process of that uh, fabricating the gravity amplifier but then uh, uh i'm at a, a tremendous shortage for power so yeah i have even tried to do that stuff on my is, own is there any electronics like as we know to chips or transistors? no things? nothing like that there's no there was no, uh, if it, even because of the tremendous power involved, too, uh, there was no direct connection between the gravity amplifiers and the uh, reactor itself. Okay. One more little question. The waveguide you're talking about, is that similar to what we're using in microwaves? You know? Very, very similar. Very similar. Yeah. Very good. Thanks a lot, Bob. This is Bar Bob. Uh, Vaughn. Okay, Vaughn. Thank you. Thank you for the call. Take care. Um, 
You touched on something. You, you mentioned all heavy metals are toxic? Yeah, they seem to be. Yeah. They're all very bad for us, then, when you say yeah, they're I, I mean, poisonous. Yeah, I mean, you know, lead is toxic. Right. You get up, you know, higher in our, you get right. uranium, plutonium. I mean, they get nastier and nastier. And element 115 is, is very you uh, just, toxic. You would just assume it was right. toxic. Right. Okay. Let's go take another call. Let's get right back to the telephone and talk to you. Hi, you're next. Let's look at what's happening on KVEG. Hello? Yes, sir. Ah, uh, yes. Good evening. Fascinating. Uh, first question, uh, is this uh, at Sector 4 also called Papoose Dry Lake, Bob? Uh, yeah. Okay. So that's interesting. It's in a place called Emigrant Valley. Not immigrant like people who come, but immigrant like people who leave. Right. As you, you can see, yeah. Papoose Dry Lake from out of the hangar door. Right. Okay. Next thing, in regards to the long-range method of uh, travel with these things, isn't a propulsion unit maybe the wrong idea? Let me bounce this off of you. I feel that this device is creating a situation where it is diminishing or removing the localized gravitational field and the long-distance being or the body that they're heading towards is actually pulling the vehicle rather than it being pushed. Am I correct in this? Well, the ve yeah, the vehicle is not being pushed, so it's maybe propulsion pulled. is a... Uh, but it's not being it, being pulled implies it's being pulled by something externally. It's pulling something else to it. Okay. It's creating the gravitational field. Great. What do you, what about monopoles? Is this any kind of relationship to monopole? You know, they've been looking for the monopole. Yeah, they've been well. They've been looking for the monopole magnet. Yeah, exactly. Uh, are, we, are we in a similar area with this? Yeah, it. Uh, but then you know, this is a gravitational force. Of but, course, uh, they're different things, but exhibiting similar effects. Right. Okay, next thing, uh, rather put the hair up on the back of my neck. Last night I saw a small white four-door Japanese car, and on the right side rear passenger door there were three 9mm bullet holes, about a 12-inch group. I was just curious if that was the vehicle that was shot at. Uh, <laughs> no, that's similar to my car, but okay. this, but they missed me. Yeah, well, this was really weird. I didn't know who'd, who'd done that. Okay, the next thing. The last time I spoke to you, I mentioned about flashings and ponds and their fusion operation. Have you heard that NEC in Japan has duplicated the results of their experiment? Uh, no, I really haven't heard much of that. Yeah, it was on the news several times. Okay, good. I'll get off the air and let somebody else in. Great, good. Keep up the good work. Okay, okay sir. Sure. Thank bye -bye. you for your call. Good next time, look at what's happening on KVEG. Hello? Are you there? I think they left. Try. Hi, how you doing? Fine, thank you. Uh, first of all, I just want to say, I'm 15, and I listen to your show every night while I'm sleeping. I don't know how I came across it, but... You're 15? Yeah. Have you joined the uh, Billy's Young Listeners Youth Group yet? No. You haven't? Uh, well, I heard some kid the other night when I was... That's right. Well, that's Brian. He's coordinating that. Oh, really? Why don't you give him a call? a month. All right. And the number is 369. Uh, okay. Five three four seven, and just ask for Brian and call him during the day, and I know he'll put you on the list. All right. Okay. Have a question for Bob? Yeah. Uh, hi, Bob. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to ask you: Do we give something in exchange for that for all this information they're giving us? Uh, I I really don't know. You don't know. I, I don't know what went on behind the scenes as far as uh, uh, you know, how we got the technology. Uh, also, uh, this. I-15 or 115, whatever it is. 115. Yeah. Does it come in, like, uh, do they give it to us in large quantities, or? Uh, yeah, 500 pounds is what I'm told. Oh. It comes in, the, the way I've seen it, it comes in discs, like, uh, little, little thin discs, like, uh, close to the size of a half dollar. Uh, and, uh, what, did you ever, did you ever own any, or? Yeah. You did? W what happened to it? It's gone. <laughs> it, was a, it, it was stolen out of my house along with some other stuff that I got from there. Oh, was that from the gover government? Uh, that's that's what I assume. I, I hope it's in their hands. I'd hate it to be in... Uh, a few people did know about it, uh, some UFO-related people, and I, I'd hate for unexperienced people to be, you know, in possession of this stuff. Uh -huh. But... Uh, yeah, that was taken. We did attend, We did get some film of it and some film doing it uh, of it doing some uh, uh, really unusual things. But, oh, really? Uh, yeah. Uh, also, uh, how how did you uh, get hired in Area 51? Uh, I was referred by a well-known physicist uh, uh, to talk to someone, and uh, I really don't want to go all into that because then I'm pointing fingers at specific people. Uh, is is like. Uh, like when you went to work there, was everyone like really quiet and all? Did they, you know, were they like all 
like were their mouths shut and all, or was it? Like, yeah, there was. A, everyone wasn't just talking, and you know, <laughs> yeah. in that day, it, it wasn't a really happy environment. Yeah. Everyone was just into what they were doing, and that was it. Yeah. All right, young man, thanks for your call. What school do you go to? Uh, Hyde Park Junior High. Hyde Park Junior High. Well, you call Brian. Join up with that group. I think you'll find it fascinating. All right. And keep listening. Okay, thanks. But stay awake. All right, you bet. <laughs> Take care. Yeah, hello? Hello. Hello. I, I'd like to ask Bob a question. Sure. Um, what year were you doing this? Were you working up there? Uh, last year. Last year, huh? Yeah. Okay, uh, I heard from, from someone that I know that's a pretty good source that uh that a small amount of plutonium like a like a picogram or something might be good for you is that true no not at all you don't know anything like that at all <laughs> no i know information completely contradictory to that oh okay well i was just wondering thank you okay thank right, you for the call he said good for you like what would you do use plutonium for it to die yeah really that's deadly right yeah it's, it's uh, that simple yeah in the lungs, it's almost, you know, immediate lung cancer. Wow. Uh, uh, it's a toxic in itself. The body has a tough time getting rid of it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's just bad news in, in any concentration. And you're messing with it, right? I, I mean, I don't have any at my house. No, but I mean, you, you said that's part of what you're working on, the plutonium thing. Uh, uh, electronic equipment to detect plutonium. Oh. It's, they're called alpha radiation detectors or air proportional detectors. Okay, why do you want to detect the plutonium? I asked that question. Uh, they use them to screen personnel that are leaving an area uh, oh. that's plutonium contaminated. They uh, check equipment for plutonium contamination, uh, so on and so forth. In other words, they don't. This is as bad as uh, uh, radio. Uh, radio was it, what's that? What are they thinking of? Radiation, I guess, right? Well, yeah, the, uh, plutonium does produce radiation. And that's the whole thing. So it's as bad as when they've been clearing the people in nuclear power plants and stuff like this. Yeah. Oh, I get it. And you're the one that's that's devising a device that's going to be easier. Uh, no, our device is just less expensive. Okay. All right, good. Bob Lazar, now Bob Lazar is uh, regarded as the nation's leading authority on UFOs. He plans a three-hour presentation, including visuals of UFOs, drawings of aliens sketched by eyewitnesses, a startling videotape regarding the JFK assassination, evidence that a live being, alien being, being held captive in New Mexico, an evening of astonishment, a show you'll talk about for years and years. And your special host will be Billy Goodman of Billy Goodman Happening, heard on Superstation AM 840 KVEG in Las Vegas, 10 to 1. That's a night with Bill Cooper, Sunday, January 7th at 5 p.m. Call the showboat at 702-385-9190 for ticket information. Yes, and don't forget if you Yes, we certainly can. Very clearly, as a matter of fact. I'd like to speak to Mr. Lazar. He's right here. He can hear you, too. Uh, Mr. Lazar, can you list your credentials? Uh, as far as what? Your schooling, your, your degrees. I have two master's degrees. Uh, uh, one's in physics, one's in electronics. Uh, I wrote my thesis on uh, uh, MHD, which is uh, magnetohydrodynamics. Uh, I worked at Los Alamos uh, for a few years uh, as a technician and then as a, a, a physicist in uh, uh, the polarized proton section, uh, essentially dealing with uh, the accelerator there. Uh, I was hired at S4 as a senior staff physicist uh, to work on gravitational propulsion systems and, and whatnot associated with those crafts. What, what school did you go to? I'd rather not say. The reason being is currently I am working uh, with them under contract, and I don't want to. <laughs> I'm having enough uh, enough trouble with this as it is. Okay. Why Why did you leave the, the Groom Lake project? I don't want to go into that either. That's uh, that's a big, long, complicated story. It gets into my personal life too, and I don't want to get into that. Have, they, have there been any attempts made on your life? Yeah. When was the last one? Uh, well, there's only one direct one, and that was, uh, I really don't remember when that was. Uh, I don't know, maybe uh, six, eight months ago, something like that. Uh, just being shot at, getting on the freeway. Another, another car drive by and shoot you? Yeah. 
Okay. Are there any weapons on board the uh, alien craft? Uh, not that I know of. Of course, the gravity generators themselves can be focused, and I, I imagine that can be used as a weapon. How many how many alien people do they hold? Uh, I don't know. How many people can you fit in the car? You know, it's. I, I imagine if there's a bunch standing up, you can pack them in there. Rega regarding this uh, uh, element 115? Yeah. Uh, it's the extraterrestrial material. Yes, definitely. Uh, uh, how, how do you suppose uh, the S4 project came to acquire 500 pounds of it if it is from, if it's not from this world? I would imagine it came on one of the crafts. Oh, extra fuel, huh? Uh, maybe. How close? Uh, how close can a civilian get to the Area 51 or the Immigrant Valley? Well, I mean, I mean, what is security like? How, how many guards and so forth? I think closest you can get is probably about what uh, 10 miles. Oh. And then you get a mountain between you and, and them. Uh, a lot of patrols, huh? Oh, yeah. Thanks for the call, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, right. All right. Uh, so, Bob, uh, we were talking off the air, and I want to touch on this. You said that you traveled one time on hydrogen with your car. Yeah, I had uh, a 1978 Trans Am I converted to run on hydrogen. We were talking about this one night, you know, as a new uh, mode of transport, not mode of transportation, but a fuel uh, for transportation. And the question that came up was, it's, is that more dangerous than gasoline? Or Depends how it's stored. There's ways you can do it. You can store it as a gas compressed in a cylinder where, yeah, it's dangerous and explosive. You uh -huh. can store it as a liquid, a uh, cryogenic liquid, where it's also dangerous and, and explosive. <laughs> or you can also store it in a hydride, and a hydride is a chemical that absorbs hydrogen like a sponge absorbs water. And when it's in that stored state, it's uh, really not flammable. And uh, you heat the chemical using the radiator water or electrically or the exhaust gas to produce the hydrogen. There's only a small amount at a time ever produced. And in that instance, it's a lot safer than gasoline, and that's the method I use. I love to hear that. Now, so in other words, we could put these in automobiles, getting back to something you... Oh, de de absolutely, definitely, yeah. Yeah, and, and there you're looking at the only exhaust is water vapor, essentially steam and very just little oxide. Uh, are you hearing this, America? Well, you know we touched on this one night. Now we're hearing it direct because people are calling and saying, we'd love to hear a scientist tell us this. Now you're telling us. A scientist is telling us, you know, getting off the UFO just for a little bit, but what is important is how we're going to get around in the near future if we lose fossil fuels and things of that nature, and they're probably going to turn into something else. But if we just turn to hydrogen, A, we could save a lot of money, and it's even safer. That's what you're saying. Yeah, if used the right way, sure, right. a lot safer. Okay, where, where do we get hydrogen from? Where do we get it from? Well, the most common place is to get it from water when you pass yeah. electricity through water. Exactly. Yeah. You get, from water. Yeah, you break down uh, the bond and you right. wind up with oxygen. So what could, what could we be charged if we were to pull up to a tank and have some water? I mean, really? Well, there, it takes energy to separate the water back into its uh, molecular okay. state and uh, right. atomic state. Right? But, I mean, if we were the driver of a car, forgetting what, what the components are inside the car, if we were to drive up, would, they would just have to put water into this particular unit? Uh, it comes yeah, to that could, simple? You could, you could make it that simple, yeah. You hear this, America? That's how simple things could be. Uh, has this been known for years in, in the scientific field? Oh, too? there's been plenty of cars that have, that have been made that run on hydrogen. The, I mean, there's, in fact, one state somewhere has their entire postal fleet, the little Jeeps to, uh, that run on uh, hydrogen. There's a company called Billings Energy. Ah. That, uh, those are the conversions. Is that Billings, Montana, by any chance? Uh, I, you got when you me, said I you know. said it was one one state that had their postal things. It, it, it might be. It might I'd be. like to look into that. That is fantastic. Why do you think it's not being made? And then availability. I mean, you know, you got that problem too. Uh, the if, problem of availability. What do you mean? If you're going to just use gaseous hydrogen. Okay. What would it take uh, to change our current uh, motors a uh, motor in a car? To accept this? Uh, oh, not very much at all. It's, so, it's very similar to a propane conversion. Oh, oil. wow. That sounds good to me. It doesn't sound good to you folks out there. We've got to get on this. Somehow or other, this has got to be brought to the forefront. And I hope someone, we can get someone on the VIP panel to talk about this. This would be a great topic to add to that uh, Sunday, January 7th, because you heard how simple it is. You have now heard it from a scientist. Have you heard from Mr. Teller at all? No. Not one word. In other no. words, he's done. Nothing at all. And the other thing you said was the anti-matter reactor, we are nowhere near being able to have one. No, no, not at all. Not even. <laughs> not, not, even. not in the least. The first thing we'll come up with uh, uh, when we toy with that some more is, uh, and there's already been talk of it, is uh, an anti-matter weapon. 
Uh-huh. Uh, that's unfortunately that's the easiest thing to to produce. So An first we'll see that before we'll see right. any, you know potential useful Did energy you? being brought. Oh, out of it. this man is something else. I mean, he says it. He like he throws a right hook and I left it quickly at them. He's getting the message across, and this hydrogen thing is, is phenomenal. And we will get back to Bob Lazar. And okay, back with more of your Billy Goodman happening. I'm just talking to Bob Lazar off the air, and Bob is a jet car driver. Jet, and he says that's how he relaxes. Doing 350 miles per hour. <laughs> that's his relaxation in life. Well, that's a, that's great. Okay, let's go uh, uh, to line one and talk to you. Hi, you're next to the Billy Goodman Happening on JVEG. Is that me? That is you, sir. Oh, my God. I can't tell if it's me or somebody else. Hi, it's Roger the Dodger. Yeah. Yeah, hello. Yeah, Billy and also Bob. He's right here. Hi. Yeah, right. Uh, you said that there was nine different discs. Are they quite different in appearance? Yeah, they're all completely different in appearance. Are they then from perhaps different uh, star systems? Uh, could be. Yeah, in other words, you said the first one, or the one you looked at, the sport model, was from reticulum, right? Yeah, that's what I read. Okay, so that has the, the gravity propulsion system. Right. So then some of the others may have some other type of propulsion system. Isn't that right? Well, I was told that the uh, reactors are all similar in them, and from that I just assume that the propulsion system is the same. But it is it is possible that the, the other ones have different propulsion systems, yeah. Yeah, right. You know, uh, uh, the light years from Earth to reticulum is how far about? What did you say? Uh, like 32, 33, 32. 34, okay. somewhere. And uh, they must get away from the Earth before they amplify the gravitational system. Do they not? They, they, don't, they don't have to, but it has to be a line of sight where they can move to. Uh, in other words, it wouldn't be, have any effect on the Earth, even though they were cl- uh, close to it when they turned it on. No, no. I see. Okay, the other question I had was, as far as religion goes, uh, and the aliens, where do they fit into it? They, they must say something about it. I've heard something about that they mentioned that uh, they had a bearing on us through religion, uh, perhaps through colonization or uh, some other method. What have you heard about that? I've I've read some about that. Uh, you amplify on that. Uh, you know, I don't want to go into that. You don't? No, because that's, that's going to upset everybody. Yeah. Okay, well, I thank you very much for the time. Thank okay. you. Uh, this is Roger the Dodger, by the way. Roger, are you uh, accepting telephone calls? Oh, yes. Up he... to 12 o'clock, you bet. No, 1 o'clock. Oh, one o'clock. Oh, that's right. One o'clock. <laughs> All right, Roger. Trying to dodge again. Yeah, you're trying to dodge it again. That's Roger the Dodger, folks. And by the way, uh, if you'd like a copy of what you're hearing tonight, or for that matter, any other of the uh, preceding happenings, you just call Roger the Dodger. He's right there waiting for you at uh, area code 702-564-4404. At 702-564-4404. I was calling to ask two questions. I wanted to know what the top speed of this craft is getting now. Can you say? Uh, it's tough to say a top speed because uh, to say speed, you have to uh, compare distance and time. And when you're screwing around with time and distorting it, mm-hmm. you, you can really no longer judge a velocity. But they do have a, a speed, though. That, is there a speed that you could judge or something? I'm sure we don't have. But no, because they're really, they're really not traveling in a linear mode where they just fly and cover a certain distance and a certain time. Mm-hmm. So that, that's the real definition of speed. Uh, you know, they're, they're bending and distorting space mm-hmm. and essentially snapping it back with the craft. So it's it, the distances they can travel are, are just phenomenal in mm-hmm. in little or no time. So speed has, has little bearing. I'm curious, uh, is uh, lasers a part of their technology, uh, the flying speed? No, I haven't, I haven't seen anything along well, that line. And the last thing I know, is Rockwell involved with that? Uh, not that I've seen. Not too soon. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you for the call. Let's go to uh, our new, new member line and uh, find out who's next on A Billy Goodman Happening on KVEG. Hello. Yeah, this is Pistol. Pistol, how are you, Pistol? I'm fine. Good. I've got a question for Bob. Sure. Right. I'll be calling you tomorrow. Okay. Uh, I've heard you mention both... Uh, a gravity or anti-gravity generator, and then an the antimatter generator. And I wondered, if, are they different? Or are they just uh, different terminology? Or uh, yeah, I, it's not a gravity generator. It's a gravity amplifier. Okay. I, I get tongue twisted all too often. Uh, the antimatter reactor provides 
the power for the craft and the basic low amplitude gravitational wave, which is too low of an amplitude to do anything. Uh, it's piped into the gravity amplifiers, which are found at the bottom of the craft. There it's amplified into an extremely powerful wave, and that's what the, the craft is uh, flown on. I see. But there is an antimatter reactor. That's what provides the power. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Take care, Pistol. Okay. All right, guys. Bob Lazar is my guest. And, boy, it's a pleasure to have Bob Lazar in studio tonight. If you have uh, a question for him, uh, feel free to give us a call. Let's go to line two and talk to someone uh, on a happening. You're next on KVEG. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hi, this is Roger Nelson. How are you doing, Billy? Roger, how are you? I'm just fine. Hello, Bob Lazar. Hello. Um, say, uh, by the way, I got through a couple of times last week but didn't make it, you know, uh, to the finish line. So I'm still in there listening. Don't worry about that part, Billy. Okay, and, buddy. Uh, the question I had for Bob, last time he was on... Um, then I talked to him. I asked him about uh, the hyperlight uh, propulsion systems he had seen. He said yes. Uh, like Roger the Dodger just pointed out, uh, the, the craft have hyperlight uh, capabilities or beyond the speed of light. Bob, do you know anybody in our government or any people there who worked on the craft, or do you know of anybody who might be from this planet, from Earth, who's taken those craft and flown past the speed of light to other galaxies? No, I, I don't, and I don't know if they've been if they've been used for that. Uh, how would there, is there anywhere to go on it? I'd be very interested to see how many of our guys on uh, particular programs have gone to space, what they're learning, exactly where they are now, and whether or not there's any tie-in with the alternative three uh, uh, escape Earth plan that supposedly the government leaders are staring up now. Is there any place uh, that, that you know of where uh, this information can be found? Uh, I imagine if, it, if any of that's in fact true, it... it it would be found in the in the midst of S4 or 51 down there. Of course, how to how to contact those guys and actually get them to talk is uh, you know that that's a feat not yet attained. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. Hey, uh, uh, what is it that I didn't hear? What it is that you now are doing for a living now that they've cut you off at the knees? Uh, I do other scientific research and uh, produce and uh, design repair uh, uh, alpha radiation detection equipment. Uh, well, a number of uh, copies of these broadcasts and uh, the show on Channel 8 and all the other stuff uh, has been getting around perhaps even internationally. Uh, has, has anybody bothered you since you went public? Uh, other than the, the silly little things that have been done, uh, no, nothing nothing big to be concerned about. Well, that's good. Uh, are we going to see you at any of these uh, things like the January 7th conference or uh, other symposiums in the future? I don't think so, no. Okay. Well, look, I think you're a very brave man, you know. Uh, with uh, that kind of an onus on your head, it, it takes a, a lot of courage to uh, keep coming back to the airwaves, and um, I stand up and cheer as one. Oh, well, thank you. All right, take care, Billy, and we'll see you January 7th. All right, Roger. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. That's Roger Nelson, uh, who is a uh, radio announcer out in San Francisco. He's at uh, KBAY. As a matter of fact, he has one headphone tuned into The Happening. And he does his radio show with the other headphones. It's a fact. It's true. That'll drive you crazy. No, he has it totally under control. And he has it totally under control. And he's a wonderful man. And he's come down here before. He was over at the Blue Diamond and uh, the other excursion that we had in town. He's going to be in town. And he always has information. And he's quick with his questions. And I mean, he's, he's just a pro. That's probably why. Let's take a little time out for these messages, and we'll get back with more of Bob Lazar. And your telephone call. Line one. You're next in the building of an happening on yes. KVEG. Thank you, Mr. Lazar. Yes. Could you comment something on your studies into uh, magne magneto hydrodynamics as it result relates to the hot spots in the Earth's flux, magnetic flux? And does that relate to the deep hole theory that the Soviet Union is playing with? Uh, well, I don't know exactly what the Soviet Union is playing with. Right, uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, I looked at it from a, uh, a power point of view, exactly. as, as, as providing a, a, on a large scale, producing uh, 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 plasma-generated energy in like a power plant situation, or producing something that would retrofit like a coal-fired plant that has a lot of waste heat and uh, you know high-energy plasma. But to end, uh, the question is, uh, are you experimenting using the Earth's flux? No. No. Okay. They're just uh, standalone uh, high energy magnets that I. That okay, I, I know there's a lot of study of the flux changing in the Earth, especially west of the uh, uh, of Greenwich. Okay, uh, I'll go zero breaking. One other question, sure. just off the wall. Uh, can you roughly give us the uh, atomic weight of one, uh, the gas, of one, of 
It's 115. The atomic weight? I know you have to guess, but uh, compared to plutonium. I hate even to guess. <laughs> I know it would be a big, uh, long shot. Uh, I, I hate to guess. I... I, I know it because I've written it down because we've we've calculated it. Oh, you I, have? Yeah, I really I really don't. Can you give us a ballpark? No, because I'd be wrong. <laughs> Just like if I gave a ballpark on the gravitational wave frequency, and that's really bugging the hell out of me because I just bugging can't the hell out of me too. I yeah, do I just, anything if I could get that frequency. Uh, in fact, what I'll do is I'll. There were three things, as a matter of fact, that for some reason I developed a mental block on. I'll have to call uh, Billy and then he well, can yes, announce it on the air. Well, you I Billy this afternoon. But I didn't think I'd get through today. Sure, that's that's no problem. I'll just call him and he can he can relay it to everyone. Be my pleasure. All right. All right. Thank you, Billy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, okay. Uh, I want to remind you folks when he says that Billy and all that for all of you out there listening, they are going to happening on KBEG. Hello, sir. Hello. Yes, you're on the new member line. Oh, uh, I'm a local caller. Yeah. First time. Well, and, welcome in. Thank you. And I'd like to stand up and cheer for Bob. Yes, sir. Let's all stand up and cheer. Come on, let's all stand up and cheer for Bob Lazar. Let's all do it. That's right. Come on. <laughs> let's all stand up and cheer. That's right. <laughs> I'll second that myself. The man that. Right, right. It did take a lot of courage, and uh, it's about time somebody stepped forward with uh, some information that's being kept from us for so long. Here, here. Uh, one question, uh, Bob. Yeah. Uh, how long do you think it took them to make their journey here? Uh, Using their method of propulsion. Uh, an extremely short time. Oh, is that right? Yeah, I, you know, I... Yeah. I'd hesitate to say again, but uh, I don't even think you're looking at days. Is that right? Yeah. Well, is that because of this gravity uh, line to force thing, or uh, well, is it it, because uh, time uh, stands still for them, and it really does take a long time, but they don't know it because time stands still? No, well, they're actually traveling almost in between time because of the way they distort time and space. So they're, they're traveling vast distances uh, without really the incrementation of time. I see. So it's, uh, you know, the, the time would be very, very little. I, it's, days is probably, I, I'm way off saying that too. Mm -hmm. But there again, I, I, I hate to say something and, uh, you know, be really far off. I had so many questions, uh, but most of them have been answered tonight by other callers. Oh, well, that's good. Uh, one more, uh, if I could. Sure. Uh, do you think that these aliens uh, could be robots of some kind, uh, and they're not actually the uh, native beings from that galaxy? Uh, I imagine it's possible. I mean, who knows what actually flew the craft? Yeah. Or whether or not aliens have ever been down in that in uh, Area S4 down there, but uh, it, it's possible that some automated, you know, creature uh -huh. flew them. Uh, who knows? Yeah. Good question. Thanks for your call. Okay. Right. Uh, keep coming back, Bob. Sure. <laughs> I keep coming back. Never heard that before. And I guess it kind of fits in when you were inside the uh, the spacecraft itself. You didn't see any sleeping quarters. Right. So perhaps they just start in the morning and they're here in the afternoon. And, and it's that simple as far as our time goes. If it even takes that long. <laughs> if it takes that long. All right. Where are we going? Line one. Okay. We go back and forth. Line one. We go on line three down there sometime. Uh, that person must be hanging out for a long time, that poor person. Uh, you're next to the Billy Goodman happening on KVEG. Hello. 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 Oh, is it me? Yes. Oh, okay. oh I just called. I didn't expect to be on. I didn't. I don't know why that happened either. I guess you just got lucky. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Lazar. Yeah. I have a question about you. Instead of uh, my name is Barbara. Instead of asking you about aliens, I'll leave that alone. Hold on, time to ask. I won't. Um, I want to know about Lane Keck, your hypnotherapist. Yeah. Um, now. When he talked on the air about you, did you request that? Did he talk about mm -hmm. me? Uh, no, George Knapp requested that, and then Lane called me to find out if it would be okay, and uh, I said, yeah, go ahead. Oh, George Knapp, okay, because I, I called the office, and that's what I was told, and it didn't seem quite... That I requested that Lane yeah. to go on? No, that's yeah. not... <laughs> that's what the, the person in the office said. And how was your how was your experience there with him? Did you um, can you talk about how you felt about your experience? Uh, as far as what, how I got along with Lane? No, as far as how you felt comfortable with with um, going back to to some unpleasant experiences. 
Uh, well, you know, there again, the emotions came up when uh, you're under hypnosis, and, you know, that, that part wasn't exactly pleasant. And how do you feel about it today? Uh, I mean, I feel better. At the, at, at the time, it wasn't very pleasant, but uh, in general, just being under hypnosis is, is a really good feeling. Do you have um, the videotape of that? Uh, yeah. Oh, so it's in your possession. Uh, I don't want to say where it is, but, yeah. Oh, I don't... I, yeah, it, <laughs> it, I would look. I, I know where it is, yeah. Okay. All right, because I'm, I'm going to be doing that, and because I, I, I was with him, and so I just wanted to, to, for my own personal information, I want to do that, because um, I have I have good aliens, bad aliens, um, you know, it runs in my family, and um, there's a... a an extreme reason why why I'm going to be doing it, so I, I wanted to clarify that and, and try to make myself feel comfortable. Although I can do it on my own, I won't go deeper than a certain point. All right, thank you for your call, and please get that line cleared up. <laughs> please get that line clear. Whoa, I thought I was... What was that noise? The alien's bothering her. Okay, hello, line three. You're next on KVEG. Hello? Hello. Yeah, I'd like to ask Bob a question. He's right there. Go for it. Is there any limit on the distance that the uh, spaceship can travel? I mean, can it actually travel, like, out of our galaxy to the Andromeda galaxy? Or basically, how far could 223 grams of the helmet one to really take you? I really don't know. Uh, from what I understand, the the actual consumption of the element is very low. So, yeah, I imagine it is possible uh, with enough jumps made, you know, to, to travel to another galaxy. Is, so, basically, they travel out. Is there is there any big difference between the... I assume the gravity waves are more powerful than the gamma waves, correct? Than the gamma waves? Or as in spectral waves, they can travel... What's the limit on light waves? Was it 10 billion light years or something? And how far light can travel? No, there's really not a... Well, a limit as far as what? It depends on the interaction. If, if gra the gravitational fields that the beam passes through, uh, you know, the, the photons right. pass through and, and so on and so forth. So there's no no real limit in true dead space. Yeah, that's true. Okay, thanks. That basically answered my question. All right, thanks okay. for your telephone call.